clap. <clears throat> Not for me. Good morning, good news. How we doing? Good. Love that. I didn't know what kind of response I would get. It's a little bit dreary outside, but um, that was better than I expected. My name is Strider, I'm one of the pastors here, and we are so glad that you joined us for worship this morning. If you are new or visiting, a uh, special welcome to you. We have something that we call the Connect Card located in the seat backs in front of you, and would love for you to take one of those out. Fill it out, and uh, on your way out the doors this morning, you can drop those in the black boxes at the back of the room. At the bottom of the card, you'll notice uh, an option to take a couple of next steps, one of which is if you would like to have lunch with a pastor. So if you're new to Good News and would like to know more about who we are and uh, to get better connected, uh, Smiley would love to have lunch with you. You could mark that on your card. One of the other options, <clears throat> excuse me, is we also have a Discover Good News uh, class coming up this Wednesday. Uh, it's our last class for this month, <clears throat> this Wednesday from 6 to 8 uh, here, uh, right in the uh, Connect room outside in the lobby. And if you would like to make good news your church home, that is your next step. You could just mark that on your card that you'd like to come. Mindy will follow up with you and make sure that you're situated and ready to go, but we would love to have you here with us on Wednesday night. Sometimes, <clears throat> sometimes we get to announce uh, really fun things, and uh, some weeks we just get to announce uh, sad things. And this week is one of those weeks on Friday, one of our members, uh, Barbara Hayes, died, and uh, we are saddened um, by her passing. But I want you to know that Barbara passionately pursued Jesus, stood firm in her faith until the very end. And um, we uh, mourn the loss of Barbara, uh, ask you to pray for her family. We don't have details yet of, uh, of a service, um, and so let me, let me pray now. Jesus, thank you for Barbara Hayes. And uh, thank you for her witness as she clung to your promises of life after death. Lord, we pray for her family, for her kids, that you would comfort them, that you'd comfort us as a church too as we mourn her loss. And uh, Lord, as, as we uh, look to passionately pursue you, let us remember Barbara's example. Lord, you have given us a status, and that is of a blessed one. And so I pray that you would help me and help us to remember that. You've called us to be pure in heart. Help us to understand exactly what that means and say yes to it, to align ourselves with it. And Jesus, you've given us a promise that the pure in heart would see God. And so Jesus, help us to understand what that means. Help us to seek and chase after your face. And we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. If you have a Bible, uh, turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. Uh, this year, we've been going through the Sermon on the Mount, which is Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. And um, the beginning of the sermon is called the Beatitudes, which is a Latin word that just means blessed. And uh, this morning, what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about hearts. And so, Matthew chapter 5, verse 8 if you would, I'm going to read it. It says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. One of the things I want to remind you of is that the Beatitudes are structured in a way that reminds us of our status. Every one of them talks about a condition, and every one of them includes a promise. And if you'll remember back to the beginning of the year, uh, we talked about the Bible is one story from cover to cover. And God is telling a story of blessedness and cursed and blessedness. Because in the beginning, God created all things, everything that we see around us, and he created man, and he blessed them. And he gave them a task and said, be fruitful and multiply. And that did not last very long before our first father and mother, Adam and Eve, decided, you know what? We know better than God. We'll take this into our own hands. And when they did, they broke God's commandment, they sinned, and God, as a result, cursed them and all creation. And the story, the story that Jesus tells is one of redemption. And as he is sitting with his disciples, his apostles, continuing to say to them over and over and over again, blessed, blessed, blessed. He is telling them that the promises that God the Father made in Genesis chapter 3 are coming true. 
One of the things that we need to understand about the word blessed is that it means approval. And it's not just any kind of approval. This is God's approval. And so as we read the Beatitudes, it is, it is incredibly helpful to remember our status. That if we have put our faith and trust in Christ, that we are God approved. God has given us his approval. But I want you to know that Jesus cares very much about the heart. And what we're going to do this morning is we're going to ask a couple of questions. The first question we're going to ask is, what, is it, what does the Bible mean by heart and what is its condition? The second question we're going to ask is, what does it mean to see God? And the last question is, we're going to, we're going to answer, what does it mean to be pure in heart? And so I know I just prayed a minute ago, but as we get started, let me pray one more time. Jesus, help us to know what is the heart and its real condition. Help us to understand what it means to see you. And Jesus, help us to know what it means to be pure in heart. Amen. 1 Samuel 16, 7 says this. The Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on his height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Here's the part I want you to notice. Man looks on the outward appearance but the Lord looks on the heart. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. In the world and culture in which we live, we are very much tempted to concentrate our efforts and our energy on the outward appearance. So we pretend, we posture. I don't like that side. This is my good side. No, I don't like that side. This is my good side. We focus on the outward appearance. And sometimes, if we're not careful, we can concentrate all our energy and effort on eating pure food and drinking pure water, taking pure supplements. And if we're not reminded of this reality continuously, that can consume us. Those things aren't a bad thing, but this morning, what I want to remind myself of and you of is that the Lord looks at the heart. And by the way, this is a message for me. Like, I get to preach to myself this morning, and you just get to listen. So everything that I'm going to say, this is for Strider. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Did you know that the Bible goes to great lengths to describe the condition of the heart? This is what Jesus says about the heart in Matthew 15. What comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. And this defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. Out of the heart come all of those things. Man looks at the outward appearance. But what Jesus cares most about is the heart. And the reality is that when you start to peel back the layers of the heart, the reality is the appearance on the outside can look fine, but the inside looks like this. This is the picture that Jesus gives us. What comes out of the mouth proceeds from this, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. That our hearts are impure. And when our hearts vocalize themselves through the mouth, they reveal the impurity of the heart. And what happens is, that was almost a disaster. What happens is, we're left with incredibly dirty hands. Jesus, despite what the commercials at the Super Bowl want to tell you, came, came to remedy impure hearts. That was his purpose. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. 
Jesus cares very much about the heart. Let me wipe this off. The heart, the heart is critical. It is crucial to Jesus. It is his mission to redeem those with impure hearts. Second question <clears throat> that we need to ask is, what does it mean to see God? And the Bible talks about three ways in which it defines the ways in which we see God. The first is we see God when we marvel at his holiness and his glory. That's one way that we see God. We experience Jesus or little bits of him, and we go, man, God is good. And he's also terrifying. The second way that we see God is we are comforted by his grace. And one of the stories that comes to mind is one in which Jesus is near the end of his public ministry. And uh, he is with his disciples, and they are touring around Israel, preaching the gospel. And they decide to get into a boat, and Jesus is tired. This is a couple pages later in Matthew chapter 8. I don't want to read you what happens. Starting in verse 23. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. Don't miss this part. But Jesus, but he, was asleep. And they went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we're perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, what sort of man is this, that even winds and sea obey him? The disciples get into the boat, and Jesus is tired, and so he falls asleep. And they are in the middle of the lake, when all of a sudden, a storm hits. And the disciples are bailing water and panicking. And then it doesn't say, but one of them got the idea, or maybe all of them, got the idea to wake up Jesus. And so they went and woke Jesus. And his response was, you have little faith, why are you so afraid? And then Jesus spoke. And the storm that was raging instantly became calm. And when they saw that, verse 27 says, the men marveled and asked the question, what sort of man is this? When you experience, when you see God's glory and his holiness, one of the responses is that we marvel at him. But they were also comforted by his grace. Can you imagine? Some of you have experienced this because you have boats and you go fishing. But can you imagine being on the water and all of a sudden a storm hits? And the waves are incredibly high, and you are scared for your life. In that moment, these men experienced and were comforted by Jesus' grace. Because Jesus spoke, and everything was still. Matter of fact, Scripture describes it as everything was calm. It was a great calm. And their response, marvel saying, what sort of man is this, that even winds and sea obey him? So when we talk about what does it mean to see God, part of that answer includes we experience his holiness and his glory. The other part of the answer is we're comforted by his grace, but there's a third answer as well. And the third part of what it means to see God means to be admitted into his presence. Because one of the things that these men experienced when they witnessed this was that this man is different. What kind of man is this? Well, he's a king. He's creator. He is all-powerful. He speaks to the storm, and it is still. 
He is the one who can take turmoil and turn it into calm. And we, we are in his very presence. What does it mean to see God? It also means to be admitted into his presence. Because not everybody, not everybody gets to come into the presence of the king. Matter of fact, there are prerequisites for coming into the presence of the king. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Our status, if we put our faith and trust in Christ, is God approved. The promise is that we will see God, not only in this life, not only experience him in this life, but even more fully in the life to come. When Jesus returns and creates a new heaven and a new earth, we will see God in a way in which we cannot see him now. We get glimpses now. We will get everything in the future. What does it mean to see God? To marvel at his glory and holiness. To be comforted by his grace. To be admitted into his presence. Think about how sometimes we use the word see when it comes to relationships with people. Like if you ever said, I got to go see my doctor. I got to go see my chiropractor. I got to go see my hairdresser. I don't have one of those. This weekend, I get to go see my girlfriend, boyfriend. When we use the word see when it comes to relationships with people, we're not talking about looking at a picture. We're not talking about interacting with them from a distance. We're talking about either making an appointment with them or coming into their very presence. What does it mean to see God? It means to be admitted into his presence. Which brings us to our third question. What does it mean to be pure in heart? Psalm 24 is the, uh, is the passage in the Old Testament that most parallels what Jesus is saying to his apostles and disciples. Matter of fact, it's, it's, it's as if Jesus is saying, if you will pay attention, what was promised in the Old Testament is coming true before your very eyes. <clears throat> Psalm 24 Verses 3 through 6 say this. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? The question, as David writes this, is who has the ability to come into the presence of God? Who can ascend the hill? Who shall stand in his holy place? And verse 4 answers the question. He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. There is a prerequisite, there is a condition that, is, that comes before coming into the presence of the Lord. And this psalm answers the question. He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false, and does not swear deceitfully. If you want to know what it means to have a pure heart, it means this. You need clean hands. You need a pure heart. Don't lift up your soul to what is false. Don't swear deceitfully, meaning dishonestly, misleading, representing yourself as one thing when you're actually another. But if you want to be pure in heart, do those things. And then verse 5. He will receive blessing from the Lord. Can you hear Matthew 5, 8 in this? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Verse 5, and he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. To be pure in heart means to have single-mindedness in seeking God. James, in his book, chapter 4, verse 8, the half-brother of Jesus, is going to help us uh, understand this context a little bit more. This is James 4, 8. It says... Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. 
cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. What James says is that the enemy of pursuing Jesus is our double-mindedness. That we are to have single-mindedness. And so when James says, you men of double heart, are double-mindedness, it's like he's saying, hey, men, this would be like having a wife and a girlfriend all at the same time. That your allegiance, that your loyalty is divided. To be pure in heart means that we single-mindedly pursue Jesus. <clears throat> One time, uh, some religious leaders were trying to trap Jesus, get him into conversations that just didn't matter. And so one of them asked him the question, which is the greatest commandment? And you know what Jesus starts his response with? This is why I know Jesus cares about the heart. This is Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37. This is Jesus' response to what's the greatest commandment? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. To be pure in heart means that we have no deception, no double-mindedness, no divided allegiance. And if you want to pursue or be pure in heart, pursue God with utter single-mindedness. The prerequisite for coming into the presence of God is to be pure in heart. But there's only one problem. Because when your heart looks like this and your hands look like this, what do you do? I tried to get this stuff off after the first service. It didn't come off. I'm in the bathroom scrubbing. Try hand sanitizer. Try vinegar. All these things. My hands are still covered in black food coloring. What do you do when you recognize that that is the condition of your heart and this is what your hands look like? Well, Proverbs 20, verse 9, expresses it for us. Who can say, I have made my heart pure? I am clean from my sin. The answer is, none of us. And this, this is the good news. One time, Jesus had a conversation with a rich young guy, and it was about eternal life. The guy asked him a question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus gives him an answer, which was supposed to prompt, I could never do that. I could never live up to those expectations. I'm in big trouble. I need a savior. But instead, the guy walks away sad because he's unwilling to do what Jesus asked and unable to respond in his need to Jesus. And his disciples turn to Jesus and say, well, if that guy can't make it, then who can be saved? You know what Jesus' answer is? It's this, Matthew 19, 26. But he looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. One of my new favorite verses is Titus 2, 14. This is the good news. If you are hearing and understanding that that is the condition of your heart, and this is what's on your hand, here is good news for you. Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us. Whenever you see the word redeem, it just means bought back with a steep price, paid for, to redeem us from all lawlessness, all the impurity of our hearts. And, don't miss this, to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. The good news is that with man, salvation isn't possible. But with God, all things are possible. And so this story of blessing to cursedness to blessing 
means that Jesus came and lived a pure life without sin. And he climbed on a cross, taking the punishment that you and I deserve. He traded places with us. And he said, whoever believes in me, whoever recognizes that their heart is impure, that they need a savior, whoever places, puts their trust in me, will not perish but have eternal life. But that is the good news of the gospel. And that is why I can say that Jesus cares very deeply about our hearts and he came to do something about it. He gave himself for us to redeem us, literally buy us back from our sinfulness. He redeemed us from all lawlessness to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. The good news is, is if you've put your faith and trust in Christ, that he has literally made you a new person. That's what 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us. That he has given you a new self, a new man. One of the questions I want to ask you today is, have you ever understood the depth of your impurity? Have you ever admitted to God that this is what my heart looks like? Have you ever recognized that your hands are covered in black food coloring? Won't you do that today? And the promise is that those who, through faith, respond to this promise in the gospel will receive eternal life and will be made holy. But here's the other thing. When you look, when you look at the context of Matthew 5, 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. It is written in present tense format, which means that if we put our faith and trust in Jesus, that God calls us to purity in him. Matter of fact, God creates purity for us and in us so that you and I can pursue purity. He gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify himself for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. One of those good works is to pursue Jesus with a single-mindedness. And so what's our response? Well, it's just like David's in Psalm 51. This is after David had come to realize the depths of his sinfulness. He had done unspeakable things. He comes before the Lord, recognizing the condition of his heart, and he cries out and says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. And that part of our response is to not only do that as a one-time recognition, meaning that we put our faith and trust in Christ, that we come to faith in Christ, but because of this present tense form, it means that it's an ongoing sanctifying process in our life too. That this is a prayer not only for lost people who are recognizing the condition of their heart for the first time, but this is also a prayer for believers on a day-to-day -day basis. And so... That leads us to our action step. So I want to encourage you, invite you, challenge you, Strider, y'all, to passionately pursue Jesus this week. To be single-minded. And so what does it mean? What would it look like to passionately pursue Jesus? Here's the first thing that comes to mind. You and I have an opportunity to come into the presence of the king every single day this week. We do that when we open his word. One of the things that is most encouraging to me, being a part of the body here at Good News, is that we read through the New Testament every year together. This week, we finished the book of Matthew. Tomorrow, we will start the book of Mark. Luke, if you'd put that on the screen. I want to invite you that if you would like to 
come into the presence of the king to read through the New Testament with us this year. One helpful thing that we're trying to do is if you send that word to that number, on Sunday nights, you'll get a text message. And it's just simply a prompt for here's the reading this week. It'll come out at seven o'clock tonight. One of the steps that I would love to encourage you, challenge you to take is just to send a text to that number and to join with your brothers and sisters in Christ in coming before the king. But I want you to know that two things are going to happen if you say yes to this invitation. Because when you open up God's word, a couple of things happen. Number one, you will experience and marvel at Jesus' glory and holiness. You cannot read a chapter of scripture without seeing that. And one of the things that happens when you see God's holiness and his glory is that your sin is revealed in new ways to you. You are, you are confronted with the condition of your heart and your hands as Jesus works to purify for himself a people for his own possession. And I want you to know that that is not easy. And so to come before the presence of the Holy One, I, I want you to understand that that's part of the process. One of the things that I'm learning to be thankful for is, um, my, by the way, my hobby is um, buying and selling baseball cards, football cards, basketball cards. And I'm learning to be thankful, and I'm, and I'm serious when I say this, and I'm learning to be thankful, um, because this is not easy. But I'm learning to be thankful for, for people who steal from me. Because when you sell, when you sell baseball cards via eBay, um, people will try to claim all kinds of stuff. And some of you own businesses, some of you have employees, some of you work in retail, so you know this. Um, but I'm learning, I'm learning to be thankful for this. Last week, a guy sent me a message on eBay. He had bought some cards from us. And he sends me a message to say, um, hey, I just want you to know that the cards that you sent me have been tampered with. Not true. And um, I, want a, I, want a, an, I want a refund. And uh, my response <clears throat> my response to this guy uh, was I was angry. And I, I had to stop and ask myself the question, why am I angry? Well, there's a couple reasons. The first reason I got angry was because this guy was accusing me of deception. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to tell him, don't you know that I'm one of the good guys? Don't you know that I work at a church? Don't you know that I'm not like all those other scammers and thieves and guys who are trying to rip you off out there? Why are you trying to do this to me? Why are you trying to hinder, hamper, tarnish my reputation? Second thing, I realized I'm angry because he's trying to take something from me. He's trying to take my cards. He's trying to take my money. He's trying to get one over on me. And every time this happens, I'm learning that these are opportunities for me to take up my eyes off of other things and to put them back on Jesus. As we walk through this sermon this year, we're going to get eventually to Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. And it says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Full disclosure, my temptation, my willingness, my proclivity to serve two masters is very much real and very much present. And I'm learning, I'm learning to be thankful for scammers, as weird as it sounds, because it makes me angry. And when I get angry, I have to then ask myself the question, why am I angry? And it reminds me, it reminds me to take my eyes off of things and put it back on Jesus. It reminds me that my reputation doesn't matter because Christ has won one for me. 
It reminds me that my security, my comfort is not in things, but in Jesus alone, who is purifying for himself a people for his own possession. I don't want it to happen. Matter of fact, I'd, never, I'd love to never get a message like that for the rest of my life. But I'm learning to be thankful for those kinds of opportunities because it gives me an, an opportunity to repent, to change my mind, to change my attitude, to rely on Jesus, to fix my attention back on Jesus. As a staff, we've been going through this book called The Gospel-Centered Life, and um, we've been walking through this maybe a chapter at a time for the past year, and I brought a copy of it just in case, you know, one of you might want to come take a look at it or take a picture of it. Um, But one of the things that I've found incredibly helpful from that book is a practical, biblical means of what it looks like to repent. Because when you come before the presence of the king and you're reminded of of, of his holiness and your sinfulness, what do you do? And so this is from chapter five of this book. And I just want to take just a minute and just kind of walk through this. Because maybe some of you, one of you, might find this helpful too. When it comes to repentance, here's five things. The first is you've got to acknowledge that you've sinned against God. When I get angry at this guy who sends me this message, my anger is actually not against this guy. It includes him, but my sin is against God alone. You have to understand and be willing to admit that your sinfulness includes the people around you, but primarily your sinfulness is about God. Number two, you have to confess forms of false repentance and selfish regret. And this is one of the things that I think was most helpful for me. Because when we say, God, I'm really sorry. God, I'll try harder. Those are actually forms of false repentance. Those conditions of remorse and resolution don't actually produce biblical repentance. And so we have to recognize that repentance is not just apologizing. Repentance has nothing to do with trying harder to be better. Repentance is actually something much deeper than that. Because of number three, that we're called to discern and repent of the underlying heart motivations that drive you to sin. So Strider, why are you getting mad at this guy? Well, it's because you're trusting or have taken your eyes off the fact that Jesus provides your security. Why are you getting mad at this guy, Strider? Well, it's because you're counting on your reputation of people you've never even met. They live in other states, but you cling to this reputation of your feedback score instead of the reputation that Jesus wants to give you. You have to be willing to discern and take some time to ask the question, what is at the root of all of these emotions and reactions that I have? Because that is the heart of the matter. When it comes to repentance, when it comes to repentance, the underlying heart motivations, that is what you are trying to confess to the Lord. And then number four, receive God's forgiveness by faith. We talk about understanding the gospel and preaching the gospel to ourselves on a daily basis. And, and this, the rubber meets the road when somebody tries to rip you off because when you recognize and discern your heart motivations, what's behind everything, one of the things that we have to do is ask for God's forgiveness. It has, has very little to do with the person who sent me a message, but has a lot to do with my relationship with God. God, would you forgive me Would you forgive me for turning to things thinking that they'll provide security and comfort? God, would you forgive me for forgetting that my reputation doesn't matter? That you have won a reputation for me. That you have given me an identity and I don't have to fight for it. Number five, rely upon God's power to turn away from sin. So we read, no one could serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Jesus, would you enable me to be single-minded, to have my heart, my eyes, my attention fixed on you alone? That that is what it means in a biblical sense to repent and turn from your sin. 
One of the ways that we pursue, passionately pursue Jesus is by opening his word, but also repenting is pursuing Jesus too. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The other thing that I know will happen, because I read it this morning, the other thing that will happen if you open God's word and come before him, reading Mark chapter 1 tomorrow, you will be comforted by his grace. You will be reminded of what Jesus did for you. You will look at his glory and his power and you will marvel at him. That is the promise of coming before the king, being admitted to his presence, picking up his word. And so that's my challenge. Strider, good news, that we together would passionately pursue Jesus this week. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for coming, living, dying. Thank you for your purity. Thank you for your righteousness. Thank you for making a way for people who have impure hearts and unclean hands to come before the presence of the King. Jesus, I pray that we would trust that, cling to it, be reminded of it, live that. Help us to be people who are pure in heart. Help us to remember what you've done for us, that you've purified us, that you've enabled us to pursue purity. And I pray, Jesus, this week, that you would help us to passionately pursue you. And I pray this in your name. Amen.